Um, up next are two more PhD students from the University of Akron, um, Elena Statue and Thibaut Hewitt. So come on up, you guys. All right, morning, everyone. Um, my name is Elena. And I'm Thibaut. And um, we are here to talk to you this morning about the North American forest, specifically looking at the underground root systems and mycelium network. Um, this both comes from our respective dissertations, um, looking at modeling root systems and looking at mycelium as a bioremediative building block. So we're going to be looking a little bit beyond human transportation today and thinking about when when you think about a forest, all the different transport that happens within that ecosystem, right? Transport of water, transport of nutrients, resources, even how, say, pollutants in a system may get um, transformed and, you know, embedded into soil and break down. Um, sediments as well, if water is moving through a system, how sediments may transport through time. So really setting the stage for looking at how other organisms and resources transport through systems. So do I click? Yes, okay. So <laughs> we're uh, going to just do a brief background and we'll start with a case study um, of Thibault's work in France, I believe, on water transport. And then we will spend some time on root inspired designs. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at multi resource transport. So again, the water, sediments, resources, nutrients, and applying that to engineering infrastructure design. Lastly, we'll look at mycelium and resource cycling. So combining that bioremediation, so um, transforming those pollutants and how you can utilize that process to then produce useful materials for architecture and other applications, and then just leave you with some final thoughts. So um, like I was prefacing before, we're looking beyond human transportation, right? So the movement of all of these different resources even um, other organisms. So we think about organisms moving across a landscape, whether they migrate year to year, or when you think about climate change and how species are starting to move northward, we need to have corridors for those um, species to be able to migrate, whether that's on land or on water. And you, have, you think about it both through like a horizontal scale as well as vertically, because uh, species might move you know, from deeper in the water column to shallower in the water column or vice versa. So being able to create spaces to allow for transportation to happen for other species. Um, and both Thibault and I have been inspired by the book that is shown on the screen. So if you have not read that book, we highly recommend it. it definitely informed both of our uh, dissertation uh, outlooks. I mean, because it really talks about, you know, the all the different communication and just how intelligent trees are. And at, while they're stationary organisms, there's a lot of things, I mean, there's a lot of things going on, like thinking about them as more of like, you know, mobile organisms, sentient beings. It's just fascinating. So I know a lot of you are nodding your heads like you've probably read this book before. So that's good. Um, I'm going to walk you through uh, a story here through images. So we're going to stop, start on the um, top here and then move our way down and get to this bottom corner. So if you look at the image here, again, we're, look, this is just a generic you know, look at the nutrient cycle. And so if you think about, if you introduce an element or if you disrupt one part of the cycle, how that's gonna have, you know, effects across the whole system. And so we think of just about how we as humans, when we build infrastructure or just, you know, impact our environment, how that's gonna change all these cycles that take place that we do rely on. We do rely on nutrient cycling to take, take place, decomposition, the water cycle, this uh, image here we found, I believe, on Instagram or Twitter or something. But it's really, it's just, you know, putting something as simple as a stop sign on a tree and creating that wound, you're, you're disrupting um, resource cycling and, like, transport for that tree. So the tree itself has a disruption in its transport just simply from a stop sign being nailed onto its trunk. So you can see that as a response to this because the stop sign was left there for far too long. Oh, like the wound kind of grows around it, right? Um, the image on the far right shows, this is the Yellowstone project. So this is a before and after series of when wolves were introduced back to Yellowstone National Park. And it shows just, you know, how much the ecosystem had changed. So again, introducing that 
top predator and how much it changed both the vegetation as well as the flow of the rivers itself. Um, and then the bottom below that image is just showing how um, you could redesign flower pots to allow for transportation of insects, right? So just simple little holes to allow insects to move in and out of flower pots. Um, and the remaining images are expanding upon that, that corridor, right? So um, some of you may have seen these like land corridors that they build either underneath um, roads or above highways to allow for migration of species. Um, so you can also think about that in terms of green roofs and green walls and like having stopover points, say for bird migrations to be able to rest and have, um, you know, access to food while they're making their way north or south. So it's just really thinking about transportation for other species, other organisms to thrive. Go for it. And we'll first start with, by showing a case study uh, that was a project I've done in Paris before the PhD, uh, where we were looking at water management in architecture and how we can use the biomimicry approach to increase its sustainability. So we're looking at different scales. The first one is the ecosystem level. And here the goal is really to study the natural ecosystem that was present before urbanization and how we can uh, include the services that we found in that ecosystem and use those uh, services as targets for the urban design. So for example, in the case of water, looking at how much uh, water was infiltrating, running off, evaporated, transpired, and used on the land, and how we can try to replicate those uh, numbers in the design. Uh, then when we look at inside the ecosystem, we're thinking of interactions between actors and how we can uh, study those interactions to um, look for ways to uh, have buildings interact with each other and help each other or have uh, within one building different components, you know, exchanging resources, again, in this case, water, and how we can transport water between different systems. And, and then uh, at the organism level, uh, building upon the super system, system, and subsystem uh, method, how we can deeply analyze um, different strategies found in, um, natural organisms and how we can integrate them into design. So for example, here you have the Texas horned lizard and how it can uh, passively collect water on its skin and also transport it uh, passively to its mouth. And so we're really looking at how the subsystems, so the functions used by this organism, uh, for example, with this morphology, are going to be optimized by the behavior of the organism and that's whole part is really adapted to the environment it lives in. So here you just have the same, but with uh, keywords. So for example, you have the hygroscopic uh, skin that allows to collect the water and then uh, those channels uh, that are transporting the uh, water to its mouth. And the goal is really then to uh, transfer those three different levels I was talking about to architectural design. And we're doing that at three different scales. The first one is more like the material component scale. Then the building scale where we're looking at interactions between building components and different buildings. And finally, the goal is to really provide the ecosystem services that were present before urbanization of the place. And so in this case, we're uh, using those tools to uh, and uh, like to study those different scales, but also connect the scales together so we can, um, you know, uh, study how, for example, water moves from the organisms, but then to the uh, larger cycle in the ecosystem. I forgot that there's a screen right there. I was looking up and I was like, oh, wow, it's right in front of me. So. Try not to do that. But now we're gonna walk you through our root inspired designs uh, case study. Um, so both Thibault and I look at root systems for two different applications. I look at it for coastal infrastructure and Thibault looks at it for building foundations. But if you think of just about civil engineering or urban infrastructure broadly, a lot of these points here um, are similar across, you know, whether you're building buildings, roads, bridges, coastal infrastructure, et cetera. 
you have you're limited by your manufacturing and construction technique and it's easy to make flat simple heavy structures right out of concrete um like cement block um rock etc and a lot of our systems um compact the soil just because they're so heavy and you're um really you're using you're excavating a lot of volume to be able to place you know, a foundation or a road in place. And so when you compact that soil, you're reducing the soil's ability to say, have water permeate through it. You're restricting its cycling capabilities, like re the nutrient cycling, and for other organisms to thrive within that, uh, that soil as well. And I mean, generally we know that our infrastructure force, unfortunately just disrupts the environment, whether that's during the construction process or just cuts off, you know, corridors. So you could say like the water to land interface, which is extremely important, say for, you know, nutrient cycling in the near shore, you think of wetlands, et cetera. But when you start to disrupt that by say putting infrastructure in place, you really break that connection um, and resource flows as well. And then considering just end of life, like what do we do with just roads that really are beyond repair or bridges beyond repair or buildings beyond repair? Um, just considering what that end of life looks like. So when Thibault and I wanted to look at root systems, we really wanted to look at their 3D architecture and morphology. Um, the problem with this is that there just aren't many examples in the literature of 3D models of different species and different conditions, different ages. So you can really think about adaptation. So how the root systems adapt to these you know, different environments and constraints. And so what we ended up doing was we did a study two summers ago at Davy Tree Nursery down in Worcester, Ohio. And we um, excavated nine root systems of three different species, bald cypress, hackberry, and red oak. So the top left image shows a hydraulic spade, which is basically giant shovels, like digging the whole tree out. And of course, we're not getting the whole root system. We're really, I mean, because a root system is much more spread out than you know the crown of the tree. These trees are about 10 or 12 years old, but we're getting essentially that, that like near morphology, like close to the trunk. And so you can see on the, in the middle image, so that's what the tree looks like once it's been, you know, the root system has been cut off from the trunk and the soil has kind of been sprayed off with an air compressor. And then we had to go in by hand and remove a lot of the fine roots with like garden shears. <laughs> um, so we spent a lot of time outside um, doing that. And the reason for it is because when we use this uh, structure for motion photogrammetry, which is that bottom image, it shows that we take a series of photos 360 degrees around that object at different angles. And then those photos are used to make a 3D model reconstruction, which you can see here. So this is a um, silver maple root wad that was actually removed by like pulling it. So that's why it looks so asymmetrical. It wasn't dug out, but it was pulled with like, a, I don't exactly remember how it was pulled, but. <laughs> but the, so and we um, so yeah the um, so that the reason we have to remove these fine roots is just because the when you're creating that 3D model they it can create like they're just too fine so it will create like bulges or just artifacts in the model so we're really looking at that coarse root morphology and so when we get these 3D models what we do is we um, create well. We skeletonize them, so we put, make a 2D sort of structure. So you can see that here on the uh, right, the top right here. And the idea is there, um, Thibaut's created a parametric algorithm in Rhino using Grasshopper, where then with that skeleton, you can extract root traits. So you can extract, you know, bulk properties like root system volume, surface, the trunk diameter, the whole length and like depth and width of that root system, but you can also look at um, length, diameter, curvature, tapering, like across the order of the root system. So if you uh, across a topological order, you could say. So starting from the trunk and moving down, really understanding just like the properties between, say, a parent root and its um, what are they called? offspring roots right yeah i'm like that's the that's the term they use in arboriculture um but being able to get all of these uh traits um either across the whole system or within that system and using those traits as sort of design parameters to work with 
when building, say, prototypes for different, you know, infrastructure applications. So this um, table is quite difficult to read, but um, it's an adaptation from a paper that we wrote uh, last year. And so what this shows is uh, the biological role models, which are all focused on like root systems here. And it's root systems like across different um, like environments. So mangroves, for instance, is one that's brought up. And then you have the generic function working principle, and then you have the engineering problem or vulnerability. Um, so we adapted that table to kind of fit all sort of engineered infrastructure or urban infrastructure. And it's broken down into categories. So you have structural support, so like how you support infrastructure, like below ground, like say with a foundation or pile system. Then you have soil penetration, so how you're even constructing the system itself. And when you think about roots and just how they're able to turn through the soil and like move to look for nutrients or water, could you use this like movement to be able to um, move through the soil more efficiently, more effectively, and then displace less soil overall? And then we've got conditions for living organisms. So again, just allowing for organisms to um, thrive in these, in these uh, spaces and infrastructure and not just having such hard flat surfaces, um, incorporating heterogeneity or habitat complexity. And then we've got multifunctionality. So this could be resource transport, like Thibault was mentioning before, between buildings, um, between um, foundations, um, it could be something like thermal exchange, water exchange, resource exchange, et cetera, or, and even with the environment itself. So um, like I mentioned, I focus specifically on coastal infrastructure through a fellowship with Biohabitats, Cleveland Water Alliance, and Ohio Department of Natural Resources. So um, this image on the left just shows different aspects of how you could place, say, a modeled root system, and this would be something that would be you know, manufactured um, and placed in different configurations that might allow for multiple functions. So while it's, say, attenuating wave energy and preventing erosion, which is primarily what infrastructure currently does, could you also have fish refuge or fish corridors, depending on how it's placed or how it's designed? And this video, which I can have play now, is just showing how when we take these concepts and we take these traits, we need to be able to at least test them in some capacity. So this is a really small like table size scale wave maker with some 3D printed roots and sediment. And, and looking at that sediment transport and just the water flow, depending on how you place the roots and what the roots themselves look like, so. And then for the foundation systems, uh, so we're looking at extracting the traits from the root systems themselves, abstracting them, and then uh, transforming, uh, transferring them to uh, building foundations. So things we're really looking at are like, for example, cross sections, uh, how they vary throughout the entire root system, uh, how the branching angle varies, how the um, bifurcation ratio between you know the parent and and the offspring varies, and also. Uh, how we can integrate multifunctionality. So here on the bottom, uh, you have an example of both providing social support, but also preventing erosion. Because in a lot of cases now, uh, we need to actually prevent erosion, for example, coastlines on slopes. And going beyond that, we can also think of how to integrate other functions, for example, uh, resource transport, uh, resource storage. So that could be uh, transport and exchange between the foundations and the soil, for example, to facilitate infiltration or to gather um, resources from the soil. Uh, for example, you have geothermal systems that could be integrated. And the other one is uh, how to exchange those resources between buildings. So for example, you know, uh, a lot of older buildings don't uh, meet uh, current sustainability standards, but when we go uh, further and we need you know, most of the infrastructure to meet those standards. How can we build new structures that can actually help uh, existing ones? And there is no, um, you know, one design solution that would work in every environment. So we're really trying to learn from the adaptation of root systems to different environments and how we can tweak the designs of those foundation systems to specific locations. So for example, on slopes, coastlines, you want to focus more on erosion prevention. But then if you're in a city, uh, you still need to provide a high structural support for really heavy structures. 
but you don't want to uh, compact the soil too much, so you always have trade-offs to think about. And you can use the diversity in the root systems to kind of follow that. And uh, lastly, we're quickly going to talk about the mycelium and resource cycling. So this project kind of emerges from the uh, current limitations of mat manufacturing materials. So um, things we already talked about throughout this um, uh, this uh, conference, but you know the majority of the materials being produced with a linear process uh, using really energy uh, intense uh, systems. Uh, it's producing a lot of waste. Um, so for example, in 2018, there was uh, 600 millions of construction and demolition waste being generated in the US and uh, 145 millions ended up in landfills and this included you know, toxic waste. So how can we like uh, stop that, um, stop those materials from entering the ecosystem and potentially polluting the place. And also how can we think of uh, like uh, grabbing new types of resources that are following more circular processes. So we don't need to increase the amount of resources we need to, for example, dig some metals or other uh, materials that are becoming rare. So mycelium-based materials, you probably most, uh, most of you probably know about those. Um, it's basically growing uh, mycelium, this uh, white uh, network uh, coming from uh, fungi on agricultural waste in order to upcycle it. And this produces a biodegradable material and we can fine tune the properties of that material based on how we grow uh, the material, what kind of fungal species we use, what kind of substrate we use, and we can also apply different treatments uh, once it's grown. And we can target different applications, for example, just in buildings, you can think of uh, insulation or acoustic uh, absorbance, but also uh, there's been studies on fire protection, uh, structural elements, and even uh, facade systems. So um, with those materials, there's also um, an existing uh, model developed by Paul Stamets, who is this uh, really famous fungi person. Um, and he's been uh, really looking at uh, fungi for, you know, bioremediation and stuff, but uh, we're trying to integrate the production of materials into his model. So his model, you know, you can see in blue, um, you're growing uh, mushrooms for food medicine, at the same time, you're uh, going to use the same spent compost. Uh, you're going to repair toxic waste by using bioremediating species. Uh, those are going to make soil for growing plants and trees, uh, creating organic debris, which you're going to use for growing the mushrooms. And we're just trying to integrate the production of uh, mycelium-based materials in this cycle. So you can actually both use the myceliated substrate and the fruiting bodies. And uh, for uh, that uh, case, we did a project with uh, Red House Studio, where we actually grew two different uh, species that are known for their bioremediation uh, potential, um, known to um, decontaminate uh, different types of contamination. And uh, we grew those on a substrate that, was, uh, that had a high contents of uh, phosphates and nitrates and um, grow those materials, apply different post-growth treatment, and then did some testing. So we're trying, we're testing here uh, three main variables, comparing the both fungal species, uh, comparing particle sizes, and then comparing different post-growth treatments. And uh, so we have the substrate. Uh, we were also able to produce uh, mushrooms with one of the species. Uh, and here you can just see some uh, samples with the compression testing, bending testing, and we still need to be able, we still need to do the chemical analysis, but in terms of mechanical uh, performance, we're um, around like similar uh, mycelium based materials or even uh, greater in terms of uh, compressive stress and elastic uh, moduli. So just to conclude, if we go back to the beginning where I was uh, mentioning, we were looking at the North American forest, right? So in the beginning, we had um, the water study. And if you think about that ecosystem level, looking at just how water moves through a forest, and you can look at different organisms present in that forest or elsewhere and how they use 
their own bodies or materials or structures to transport water. Then we looked at root systems, thinking about um, how those root systems can inspire um, infrastructure and that multi-resource transport, thinking about water flow, sediment flow, et cetera. And then la lastly, we ended on mycelium building materials. So this just sort of gives just some, if we think about how to design infrastructure and we're considering other re resources and other organisms, then we want to be considering other species and decision making when it comes to designing you know, infrastructure systems, addressing impacts to resource flow, emphasizing that multi-scale framework in design. So looking at the material scale to say the building or individual component scale, all the way to how those systems are connected, um, providing ecosystem services rather than minimizing them or disrupting them entirely, integrating blue and green corridors in built environments. So again, allowing for species to migrate naturally or whether they need to migrate due to climate change and implementing uh, circular processes. So thinking about how to use uh, infrastructure or systems at the end of their life cycle, um, even toxic materials and being able to produce them into materials or other you know, uh, components you can use to build additional infrastructure. And I mean, really what we, what we think about when we're coming at it from different areas like coastal infrastructure and building foundation, it's not, it doesn't directly tie to transportation, but really the hope with just re-envisioning infrastructure and just how we interact with our environment that generally we would increase connectivity between humans and their ecosystem. So I will leave you with that and all of the support we've had over the years. Um, so we have um, special thanks to quite a few people who are here in the audience today, um, as well as our uh, lab members and Dr. Petra Gruber, who is here with us and will be presenting later. Um, some of our partners, Davy Tree Nursery, like I mentioned, uh, my sponsors, Morton Arboretum as well. And we are happy to take questions for the last few minutes. Thank you. So we do have time for a couple of questions. Oh, we got one. Online, okay. Uh, so first, excellent job, fantastic work and presentation. We have a question from Camille, um, who'd like to know, do we need to use biosids if we want to create a mycelium product? So can you, re do we need to use what type? Biosids. Bio what? B-I-O-C-I-D-S. I can't do with the... Biosides? Well, I think toysons. Oh, that's what it's. Oh, no, 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 we don't. We don't need to. Like the the base is just an organic uh, substrate that the fungus can feed on. And here we're just adding this uh, contaminated substrate so we can combine, you know, making building materials, but also decontaminating substrate. It's like this added thing. But you don't, you can just use any substrate. One example is just straw. Like you can just use straw, but we're trying to combine the um, the mycelium potential, you know, where we can grow mycelium uh, to produce building materials, but also use contaminated substrates so we can also bioremediate it. Any questions from the audience? And you might have, we might have answered that already, but I wonder, oh, you're planning to use the tree's roots architecture to, to, to stop the erosion, which is a magnificent idea. I love the fish corridor thing, so cool. Um, I guess I have two questions. One is, are you planning to make artificial trees? Why not use existing roots that are dead, for instance? Do they degrade or what's the problem there? Mm -hmm. And the second question is a bit more esoteric, I think, which is the root system is kind of disordered. It follows some fractalic rules and the branching, and, but it's not a symmetrical thing. It's not something you could, let's say, make out of easily out of uh, specific angles and out of metal or out of something like this. Is that an advantage or a disadvantage for your purposes? So if you were to make it out of wood that is already cut up and you just nailed it together into this perfect shape, would that be better or worse? Uh, I, th I think it would be worse, but I'm not sure what you think. Yeah, so I can take the first question and I think you can take a stab at the second one. So um, yeah, I mean, I of course say use real trees first or you know existing root systems i mean when you think about just ecosystem restoration generally and say stream or coastal restoration they want to use existing trees on site or um, if they do have to remove the trees repurpose them to say be like these large woody elements 
that serve as sort of breaking up the water flow or allowing water to flow in a particular way to reduce erosion on a bank. The unfortunate, um, say, case for, I study particularly Lake Erie, which makes sense as it's, you know, not too far away from here, um, <laughs> is that um, it's a very altered shoreline, very urbanized shoreline. And there's just, I mean, the whole Lake Erie watershed is like 20% covered by trees. So there's just not the access to trees that that we have. I mean, we have to truck them in often from Pennsylvania or New York. And then you think about just invasive bugs and beetles, which do unfortunately happen, come through that process. And so we want to use real trees where we can or repurpose existing materials. But if we are able to kind of um, manufacture something that mimics that, at least as, say, a placeholder to create um, conditions, say, like calmer conditions, um, so you can facilitate, say, a coastal wetland to grow. So the idea is that they're temporary, but that you have such tunability um, to be able to play around with sym symmetry or tapering or some fractal, you know, um, elements. And you wouldn't be able to have the same kind of flexibility with real trees, but it primarily comes from the just lack of availability, really. And then you have the second one. Yeah. So about the one with asymmetry and stuff. Yeah. The, the root system is also uh, growing through the ground to, you know, do a lot of other functions. And here we're mostly looking at structural support, erosion prevention. So it really depends on the location where you want to introduce that uh, system. And I think the main uh, limiting factor is mostly in the manufacturing technique, but also the soil insertion. So how do you insert those systems in the ground? And, you know, root systems, they grow from the tips. They just uh, can uh, rotate, like uh, turn in the ground and stuff. So we're really also looking at more like uh, innovative technology to dig through the ground and uh, disperse the material where we want it. Um, so, yes, you can like probably push it in the ground, but the goal is also uh, to limit um, the disruption we do to the ecosystem. So how can we think of new ways to introduce those systems in the ground? Right. That's all we have time for. Thank you very much.